Lewis, and welcome to Freckles and Blondie, your weekly lost podcast discussing one of the best and most divisive television shows ever made. <laughs> I'm Randy. I'm Tiffany. And today we'll be discussing season one, episode 14, called Special. This episode was written by David Fury, who previously wrote Solitary and Walkabout. Uh, as we've mentioned before on the podcast, he was also a writer for many other shows, uh, including Buffy and Angel. The episode was directed by Greg Yatanis. Yatanis? I don't know if that's how you say that name, sure. but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, he also directed episode nine, Solitary. And this episode originally aired on January 19th, 2005. There were many points during this episode where I actually stopped and thought, the direction in this episode is really good. Really? Yeah, which I hardly ever do. I hardly ever notice. I don't either. Like, what point specifically made you think about that? Um. So the first thing that comes to mind is Michael, when he goes to... Shoot, what is her name? Susan. S Susan. Susan. Mm -hmm. When he goes to Susan's house in Australia, like, just the way that scene a shot of him entering that like intimidating house and oh yeah opening the box with all his letters in it and like the way it pans up to the ceiling and we see that sort of dharma initiative logo thing on the ceiling what there's a dharma initiative thing on the ceiling it's not really but it's the same symbol oh, okay <laughs> wow i missed that that's crazy <laughs> i know i was just like whoa this is cool there were a few moments like that. That's just the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, that's interesting. I always mean to keep an eye on the direction, and then I just never do. <laughs> I don't know why. It's because it's like it's so rare that you see something that wasn't directed well. It all seems to be good. It's just the standout ones are kind of hard to see, I guess. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, though. Yep, that's a good point. So... Shall we get into the episode? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, it was, it was a solid episode. Um, I liked where, I liked how Michael and Walt's relationship kind of evolved. Like, I kind of felt like they reached a new place at the end. And I like when characters do that. I've said that before. Yeah, that's true. They did. What about you? Did you like it? Uh, yes. I think. I kind of wanted a little more happening in, like, the B-plot, you know, the mm -hmm. not Michael and Walt storyline. But other than that, I liked it. I think it was just, it all felt very focused on them, and I kind of like to dabble in and out yeah. of, you know, all the different happenings on the island. I feel like some episodes we've got, like, so much going on. So then an episode like this, it all feels a little slow in comparison yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I thought I was going to be more annoyed by Michael when I was rewatching this, but I feel like by the end, he comes out rather well. He does, but it's weird because some of those things that he does that are good are in flashbacks, and so the, th the good things he's doing don't seem chronological. It's not yeah. like he had like this epiphany. <laughs> They're just like <laughs> random good things. That's a good point. So I'm, I can't decide exactly how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, I think I also, I like him a little bit more by the end because compared to Brian, Susan's husband, mm -hmm. I think Michael looks really good in comparison to him. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but <laughs> everyone benefits from a low bar. <laughs> yeah. I think some of his best moments are in this episode, but I think some of his worst moments are too. Yeah. I would agree with that 100%. Oh, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So, previously on Lost, Claire and Charlie were taken by the mega creep Ethan. Saeed said we're not alone on the island. And Charlie informs Jack that all they wanted was Claire. We open with a shot of Michael's eye. He's looking for Walt in the jungle. He crosses paths with Charlie who asked if he's seen Claire's bags. Michael says no, and asks Charlie if he has seen Walt, and he also replies no. Charlie leaves, 
and Jack comes up carrying firewood. Walt apparently took his dog for a walk, but wandered a little too far. Hurley drops in, looking for someone to play golf with, but Michael leaves, continuing to yell for Walt. Hurley comments to Jack that Michael seems to hate being a dad, and Jack replies, it's hard work. I feel like Hurley is kind of on the nose. (laughs) Yeah. He does seem to hate being a dad. Yeah. I think he's trying, and he knows he should be good for Walt, like he wants to do the right thing, but it's hard. You really see why it's so hard in this in these flashbacks, because he literally just became Walt's, you know, official dad Yeah, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> this is quite the test as a parent. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I liked the line when Jack said, yeah, I listened to my dad maybe a little bit too well. For sure. That was a nice callback, I thought. <laughs> you definitely did. <laughs> yeah. We cut to a flashback. Michael and his pregnant girlfriend are shopping for a crib. The one that Michael picks is expensive, but Michael tells her he should have some construction work coming his way. When she asks about his art, he says it's fine. He'll just put it on hold while she's in law school. They talk about baby names. His girlfriend wants the baby to have her last name since they're not married. And Michael wants to name the baby after his father, Walter. This is a cute scene. Yeah, it is cute. I think it's kind of strange, though, that they never address why they don't want to get married. Yeah, I wish we got more details about that as this... Yeah, I mean, it's fine that they don't want to get married, but does Michael want to and she doesn't? Does she want to and he doesn't? That would be pertinent information. Yeah, definitely. It seems to me they're, they're... I get the feeling that they haven't been dating that long, and then she all of a sudden got pregnant. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Their relationship just kind of has that tone to it. I don't know if that's true or not, but... It does have that tone to it. And they seem very young. Yeah, they do. She's going to law school, and he seems very immature. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. I really like the actress who plays Susan. Yeah, I do too. Something about her. She just seems very in control and also... Like, a lot of the things she does, if another actress had been playing her, it would come off really cold, Mm -hmm. but she has kind of a genuineness about her that really helps. I I don't hate her, as even as she's doing things that obviously really suck for Michael. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, her name is Tamara Taylor. Yeah, she's great in this episode. I like her a lot. The actor who plays Michael, Harold Perrineau... He's also really good in this episode, I thought, for the most part. Yeah, I thought he was pretty good, too. I had a little PTSD from all his Walt shouting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I wrote down, like, we should start a running count of how many times he yells Walt's name, <laughs> starting with this episode. <laughs> if you're new to the show, just brace yourself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's constant. <laughs> He's really got it down, though. I'm sure every time... That poor actor meets anyone. They want him to say, Walt! Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's going to follow him around for the rest of his life. (laughs) He's probably just like in the airport, minding his own business, and people are screaming, Walt! Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Locke is giving Walt knife-throwing lessons as Boone watches from the side. Walt misses and is frustrated, but Locke tells him he can do better. He tells him to visualize the knife hitting the knot in the tree to see it in his mind's eye. Walt concentrates and hits it dead on. Suddenly, an angry Michael appears, grabs the knife, and tells Walt to head back to camp. He accuses Locke of pitting Walt against him and tells him to stay away from his son. Boone tackles Michael to the ground, and they fight before Locke pulls them apart. He tells Michael that he's still treating Walt like a kid and that he's been through a lot. He thinks Walt is different, and now that they're on the island, he should be allowed to reach his full potential. Michael again tells Locke to stay away from both of them, and we cut to the title scene. A lot happens in this scene. Yeah, yeah. This is what we were talking about before. I forget which episode it was, but when they were playing golf for the first time, and Michael just abandoned Walt, you know, (laughs) to keep playing golf. 
It's like, well, maybe you hadn't always been just leaving him alone. This wouldn't have happened. <laughs> right. And it's like, I just, I don't know what he expects Walt to do. Like, know. Is he not supposed to associate with anyone else on the island except Michael? It just seems so unreasonable. Yeah. And if Michael had wanted that, he should have kept a better eye on him. You know? Yeah. It's just so crazy. I love that Boone charges Michael. Yeah. <laughs> he has become such a, like, loyal little minion for Locke. <laughs> I know. It's so interesting to watch that after... Because I feel like before the last episode, I mean, he was hanging out with Locke a lot, but he was always like, all right, you're a pretty weird dude. But now he's, like, totally into it, which is... Yeah. A little crazy. Well, but. now he's had this revelation about Shannon because of Locke, and now Locke has his complete loyalty, just the way Charlie does. Yeah, that's true. Still <laughs> wish Locke would have gone about that a different way, but yeah, <laughs> Boone is completely committed to Locke. <laughs> he is. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Walt is fascinating in this episode. There is just something about him and i mean the title of the episode is special we're definitely supposed to see that walt is special and i never really articulate why but yeah. scenes like this where he throws the knife and he just he gets it exactly what he wants and he and Locke are just they both they get it they get whatever this special thing is that's happening on the island I feel like that's why the two of them have bonded, because mm -hmm. they're both special. Yeah, that's a good point. It just, it's, to me, this episode introduces that extra, like, creep factor to this whole thing, you know? Like, I don't really yeah. know what to think at the end of this episode about Walt and what he supposedly can or, or can't do. Yeah, I know. It's, it's all really ambiguous. It is. <laughs> And this is a storyline that <laughs> I never feel like I get a full grasp on this. Yeah. Not same. to like deter anyone from watching ahead if you're, you know, watching this for the first time. <laughs> but I just never feel like I quite understand Walt or what is going on with him. Yeah. I wonder what the initial, like when they sat down and th thought about what's Walt's story. I wonder where they saw the ending, like if they had it all planned out or they were just going along with it. So I've heard before, and I don't know how true this is, but I've heard that the, I don't know who it was, maybe Damon Lindelof, but someone in the show wanted Walt to be like psychic Ooh. and to have, basically to have magic powers. <laughs> but the producers or people at abc did not want that to happen they were like no that's not allowed we're not doing that that's too crazy so they just like pulled it back and mm -hmm. we've got this kind of like weird in between thing with walt interesting which i mean it i feel like it leaves us just kind of confused yeah it's always fascinating to know how much the producers have control over certain shows yeah because i feel like as we go through this I'm learning that they actually had a lot of control over, like, the writers and the decisions they made. Whereas on other shows I've watched and, you know, when I've heard the writers or actors talk about how controlling the producers or the network was, sometimes they're like, they let us have, they let us do whatever we want and it was great. I think that's the difference between primetime TV and, like, cable networks and Netflix. You know, like, I feel like we've gotten a lot more freedom 10 years from Lost than they used to have. Yeah, I keep forgetting that. TV is so different now than it was in 2005. It's so much more diverse now. Mm -hmm. And it used to be like everything came on. ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS. Right. And that was it. <laughs> right. Reruns were on the other channels. <laughs> yeah. And now like if you told me I can like if you took away my actual cable tomorrow, I'd be like, okay, that's fine. Like, it doesn't, you know what I mean? They're not yeah. as... I don't have cable because I don't need it. Right. You really don't. <laughs> I have no idea what time most of my favorite shows come on. It doesn't matter because I'm going to watch it whenever I watch it. Right. Exactly. But 
back in the day, I could tell you, I can tell you right now that Lost used to air Wednesdays at nine o'clock on ABC because we were freaking there downstairs in our living room waiting at yep. 855. <laughs> yep. We absolutely were. <laughs> it was a different time. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. I think it was kind of fun, though. I, I, not to get wildly off topic, but I feel like it was a good show to watch as it was airing. Yeah. It was good in the beginning. I feel like as it went on, it got more frustrating. But <laughs> <laughs> It was definitely torture to wait for it to come out all the time. Uh huh. Because there were a lot of long breaks with Lost, but I feel like even just the fact that there were commercial breaks, because now when I watch stuff on Netflix, there's like no commercials. Right. But the commercial breaks gave you time to digest and like talk about what was happening and debate it. And I just love that. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely gave you a lot more time to discuss and theorize. That's probably one of the reasons why it was so popular. Right. You'd get an episode and you'd think about it for like a whole week mm -hmm. or longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just cool. Yeah. <laughs> In a flashback, Walt is now a baby. Michael is telling Walt's mom that he won't allow her to take him to Amsterdam. She says Michael knows that she's always wanted to do international law and that this is a huge opportunity for her. She reminds him that they've talked about taking a break, even though they still love each other. Michael offers to go to counseling, but Walt's mom, whose name is Susan, has already accepted the job. Michael is mad, saying there are laws against this kind of thing, but they're not married, and Michael hasn't worked in months. Susan says she needs some time as Michael watches Walt play. This is sad. Yeah, it is. It's like, damn, things went downhill really fast for the two of them. They did. And it's a little tricky because, of course, we're not going to be in Susan's perspective. So we don't know all the reasons she's leaving. Mm -hmm. I mean, Michael not working for months is probably contributing. Um, But... Yeah, I don't, maybe it's just the actress, but I'm like, okay, girl, I get it. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't even judge her that much. <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> I feel bad for Michael, regardless. Like, it's so sad. I can't imagine your child being taken away from you. Right, because he actually, I mean, you can tell he loves Walt and he wants to be around for him. And yeah, his mom's he seems just into like, it. Bye, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's no coincidence that in this scene, he's playing with Walt. Yeah. He's trying to be a good dad. It's like you said, it's hard because I get her point of view, too. I mean, she's getting a huge opportunity to do something she's always wanted to do. And she's obviously thinking that she's going to have to provide for Walt since Michael's not working. So, Right, exactly. It just kind of logically makes sense for her to pursue her career if Michael is not doing anything with his. Right. And little Walt is so cute. <laughs> he is so cute. That baby is adorable. <laughs> it's nighttime, and Michael is watching Walt sleep. Son comes up and asks him if he's okay. Michael admits he doesn't know how to talk to Walt or tell him that he's on his side. He says it's hard to stop treating Walt like a child because he missed his whole childhood. Michael doesn't want Walt to grow up on the island. The next day, Jack is talking to Saeed and Shannon about Rousseau's maps. Saeed says he's figured out that the maps point to a location on the island, possibly the power source of the distress call. Michael wanders over and is not interested in going on another hike or doing anything else to set up house on the island. He suggests building a raft. The other three look pretty skeptical. Especially Shannon, who gets seasick. <laughs> Michael says, whatever, he's going to build one and get his son off the island once and for all. And I'm sure this plan is going to go really great. <laughs> <laughs> I I appreciate that he does have a plan, at least. <laughs> yeah. My biggest pet peeve is when people just whine and complain, but don't do anything. So if Michael's going to whine and complain about being on the island, he's... You know, he's going to put together a raft and do his best to get off. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm and I feel like he's, he's been one to whine and complain before. So yeah, good for you, Michael. 
I mean, it does seem a little bit of a 180 since he was just talking about setting up plumbing in the caves. I guess he just changed his mind. <laughs> yeah. But whatever. I'm sure this raft plan will go great. Like you yeah. said. <laughs> it'll, it'll end happily, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I noticed that Shannon was very like, she's not annoying in this episode at all. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, she's not in it very much, but yeah. She's fine. No, but like every scene she's in, I feel like it's not the same Shannon we've had before. She seems more mature. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, she does. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep an eye on her and see how she's doing. <laughs> like in this scene with Jack, they're like, she and Saeed are explaining the map together. It's not Saeed doing it alone. That's true. I do like that dynamic. But then I feel like she counters it when she says she gets seasick. <laughs> like, like, oh, I'm not coming. I get seasick. Like, this isn't going to work. Don't build this raft. I'm not going. Yeah, I mean, she's always going to be comedic relief. But I don't feel like that's super immature thing to say. It's just kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, she's she's better in this episode. She's not laying around tanning and painting her fingernails. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Walt is reading his Spanish comic book with Vincent, trying to sound out the words. He sees a picture of a polar bear. Michael walks over and says he needs Walt's help with something, but Walt is not interested. Michael tries to talk to him about the pictures and drawing and perspective, but Walt isn't listening and Michael isn't very patient. He snatches the comic book from Walt and tells him he needs to keep an eye on him. Um, when he takes that comic book from Walt, I just get so angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just bugs me. I know. That's like when, like, a parent snatching, like, a favorite book from you when you're reading. Yes. <laughs> so uh, rude. It's so rude. And it's also this moment and later when he burns the comic, I'm just like, this was your chance to bond with your son over something you both have in common. You both enjoy artwork. So why right. would you burn the one piece of artwork on this island? It just makes no sense. No, it absolutely doesn't. It's just so dramatic, too. Yes. <laughs> Ugh, I just don't have the patience for dramatic crap like that. <laughs> I know. Sam. <laughs> Michael is talking to Susan on a payphone on a busy street. Walt is now 21 months old, and Michael wants to talk to him, but she says no. She says she'll have to call him back, but Michael hears another man's voice in the background. Susan tells Michael she's been seeing someone named Brian Porter. Michael gets real mad and says he's coming to Amsterdam to get his son back. He hangs up the phone and crosses the street, where he promptly gets hit by a car. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so dramatic. <laughs> Yeah. I wrote that so many times when I was watching this episode. Everything was just like, oh, this is so much drama. Michael is so dramatic. I know. That's why a lot of people don't like him. Yeah. <laughs> He's a very passionate person. He is a very passionate person. That's for sure. <laughs> and it's a shame because most of it is rooted in a good thing. Yeah. Like caring about your son. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And yet he manages to take even that to an ex excess. I'm thinking every trait you have in an excess can be bad. That's, yeah, that's so true. That's so Michael. Right. He's just, he cares about Walt and he's trying to do the right thing, but like, I don't know what it is. The obsessiveness, something about it just makes it completely irrational and like Walt can't connect to him when he is like that. Right. Right. I wish he had learned more of a lesson in this episode because I feel like that's such an important character trait for Michael. Like yeah. he, he does things later on that or it's like almost because he is so obsessed with taking care of Walt. You know what I mean? Without right. giving it away, but <laughs> Well, and it's so interesting how many times even in just this episode and it'll continue, he is stopped by some sort of outside force from taking care of Walt. Like, the car hitting him. Like, mm -hmm. it's weird because it's it's such a mixed message. Is Michael supposed to be Walt's father? Like, is he supposed to be the one taking care of him? Like, I'm not sure exactly where the show comes down on that. 
Hmm. That's an interesting point. I never thought about it that way. I don't really know the answer. (laughs) (laughs) I just was noticing how many times, you know, he is prevented from doing what he wants to do. He wants to take care of Walt, but it's like everything in the world is telling him not to. And then when he does, he's not very good at it. Yeah, good point. And I feel like they've already raised that kind of that same question with Claire. Right. And her, and her baby and how, you know, she went to the psychic and he told her, you have to raise this child. It can't be anyone else. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. I've never connected Michael and Walt with Claire and her baby, but that is the perfect juxtaposition. Mm-hmm. I wonder if they did that on purpose. I don't know. <laughs> Kate comes up to Charlie on the beach. He's found Claire's luggage and is looking for Claire's diary. He can't find it and says someone's taken it. And I'll give you one guess as to who that could be. But first, that scene (laughs) is beautiful. Yeah, it is. Do you remember that scene with Charlie and Kate? This is another time when I was like, wow, this shot is gorgeous. Go director. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I did notice that. It is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like all sunlight. Yeah. Continue with your sore, ba- sore bashing. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so typical of him. I don't, it's just, I don't know what else to say about it. I've already said everything I can say about Sawyer. I feel like <laughs> this is like the eighth time. I feel like we've had this scene play out or the scene that's coming play out so many times. It's just. I'm over it. (laughs) He's got everything, man. He's keeping it safe. You know what? Don't. (laughs) (laughs) And he didn't read the diary. He was going to. (laughs) He was not going to. What? Ever. (laughs) He, oh my gosh, that is totally what he was implying. But think about the mindset he must have been in. Claire's been gone for about a week. He goes looking through her bags, presumably to find something that he can take. I guess she didn't have anything that she really wanted except for the diary because he was like, hey, I'm bored. Maybe this will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, that is awful. (laughs) He's not doing anything that Charlie doesn't do in this episode. Yes, but the intent, except Charlie actually reads it. (laughs) But the intent is different. Sawyer is creepy and leering and selfish about it. Charlie's intent is completely different. I mean, that's just... That's the way you're reading, Sawyer. There's so many other ways to read no, it. No, there's not. <laughs> yes, there are. You don't know his intent. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and Kate knows that he wouldn't actually read it. She calls it out, and he's like, yeah, whatever. I was going to. Then why did he take it if he wasn't going to read it? Because he has to have the things. That's his power. What? But why? <sighs> Why does he need that power? It's so selfish. Why? If he doesn't have anything, who is going to talk to him or associate with him? No one, because he's the worst. No one. (laughs) Exactly. This is how he is connecting with people. This is his weird thing. Sawyer, there are better ways. (laughs) There are far better ways to be a human being. (laughs) I knew you were going to be so mad when I saw this scene. (laughs) No. It's just, it's so fascinating that you read him in such a completely different way. (laughs) I do. (laughs) Because I feel like whenever we talk about Jack, all the things that you don't like about him, I could kind of see even if I disagree with. Mm -hmm. But everything I don't like about Sawyer, you're just like, you're reading it completely differently than I do. And I don't understand. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. And I, I know I'm generous with Sawyer, but... I think we're supposed to see more to his actions than what he's doing. Like, he just, he's always so complicated that I always kind of analyze the crap out of every little thing he does. Yeah, I just wish, because I feel like he was making little steps toward becoming a little bit better, but this scene just feels like the same old Sawyer. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay. This is terrible, but we've already seen this a thousand times. Like, do something else. Please stop making life difficult for everyone else in this island. It's so unnecessary. I guess. Yeah, it is similar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, okay? <laughs> I know. It is. It's definitely, this has happened before. I, I just, I think it's significant that he didn't read it. It's so funny. Oh, my God. It's so funny that you read it like that. 
<laughs> See, why do you believe him sometimes, but not other times? Like, why do you believe him when he says, oh, I was going to? As opposed to, like, what other Like, times? I feel like normally you're like, he's completely untrustworthy. I don't believe anything he says. But if he says he's going to do something bad, you totally buy it. Because he's a bad dude. Like, <laughs> he's selfish and kind of See, terrible. I, I don't think he's a bad dude. I think he's just misunderstood. <laughs> he's had a hard life. He's been a victim, but he made these choices. He has... Oh, my gosh. Anyway, (laughs) I love how Sawyer has, like, two minutes in this episode. We've, like, talked about him for ten minutes. Sawyer scenes are just dynamite for us. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Michael is having Walt look through plane wreckage for something they can use as a frame, although he doesn't share his raft idea with Walt just yet. Walt thinks he's being punished... But Michael says they're taking control of their destiny. Kate and Charlie approach Sawyer's tent. It's empty, but he's sitting behind them. Charlie asks him for the diary, and Sawyer wants to know why everyone always accuses him of stealing things. He pulls out the diary, but holds it back from Charlie, asking if he wants to know what Claire wrote about him. Charlie says no, but Sawyer decides to read some passages anyway. Charlie punches his injured arm, Sawyer fights back, and Kate steps in to break up the fight. Charlie walks away, and Sawyer admits to Kate that he didn't really read the diary. So yeah, we've already talked about this, but anytime Sawyer's getting punched, you know, it's fine with me. (laughs) No, I was really excited to see Charlie do that. Okay, why? Okay, you say that, but if this has been Jack, you would have been really mad. (laughs) Because Jack doesn't usually have a good motivating force like charlie is distraught with worry for claire so it just it makes <laughs> sense and he like is not going to take sawyer's crap right now whatever oh my god <laughs> okay i'm mad at charlie for punching sawyer Do, are you happy <laughs> no i'm not happy with any of this <laughs> oh that's hilarious <laughs> oh i was just like good for you charlie because i just feel like he's you know yeah. He, he would, he would easily be kind of pushed around by someone like Sawyer. So I'm glad that he's not. Yeah. I love Charlie in this episode. He has some of my favorite scenes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Me too. And you know, it's weird. I have never really liked Charlie that much, but I like him now that we're rewatching it like this. Really? Yeah. I've never been a big fan of Charlie. Interesting. I feel like he's a lot of people's favorite character. It's interesting that you've never really warmed up to him. I I didn't before, but like watching it closely, I I like him a lot more. I think he's easy to kind of disregard. You know how I like the really complicated philosophical kind of characters, I guess. Mhm. And Charlie's not really like that. He's usually more lighthearted and fun. And I guess I kind of go to Hurley for that. So Charlie just never seemed to matter to me. (laughs) That's so sad. (laughs) I know. (laughs) See, I feel like I like Charlie more because I feel like he's more relatable. Mm -hmm. And obviously also because, as I've mentioned before, Dominic Monaghan, who plays Charlie, is kind of the reason I started watching this show. Right. I mean, in rewatching it, I think it's really nice to see Charlie's arc and to watch him grow and change throughout the show. Yeah, it's great. Oh, I can't wait till we do next week's episode. It's one of my favorite episodes. It's about Charlie. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) It's going to be hard to top the moth. I know. Back with Michael and Walt, Walt sees Lock and Boone walking into the jungle. He tells Michael he's going to get some water and follows them. At the caves, Shannon confronts Boone about the fact that they never bring back any food. Boone brushes her off, and Shannon tells him that Michael is building a raft. She was thinking of helping and asks Boone to come too, but he says no thanks and walks away. She's changed a little bit. She's making baby Shannon steps. She comes off so manipulative here. Don't you think? I think she's just surprised that he doesn't want to help her. I feel like she's the jealous one now. 
like before it was Boone watching her and Saeed from the shadows. Yeah, maybe but a little bit. I mean, I don't think she's near Boone level, but yeah, I can see her being kind of jealous. Yeah. I just, I liked her saying, I was thinking I could help Michael build the raft. Like, that's just, she would never have said that like 10 episodes ago. That's funny because I feel like when, when she says that, I don't believe it. Really? Yeah, I don't believe she oh. would ever have helped build that raft. I feel like she's only saying that so Boone comes with her and she gets him to herself. Do you know? I don't know. She specifically says that she thinks she could help build the raft and that Boone could help. So I'm not sure what her intentions are. I mean, I read it kind of the other way that she was going to help and she wanted Boone to help too. But, I mean, you could be right. It's definitely open to interpretation. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's just how I read it. I just feel like the look she's giving Boone is the same look that she gives Charlie when she's help- when she's trying to get him to help her catch a fish. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's- yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a little toned down from that, but yeah, it, it is, is kind of similar. I think she just is not used to Boone not just dropping everything to do whatever she's doing. Yeah, absolutely. But I like that she even sees herself as capable of helping build the raft. Because mm-hmm. that's exactly what we've needed Shannon to do, is to realize she's not useless. It's time to help. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So whether she wants to do it with Boone or not, at least she's stepping forward a little bit. <laughs> you were, you're giving her so much credit. It's great. I am. I'm... Shannon's interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's definitely, a, she's a character who has growth. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Walt approaches Locke, who says Michael doesn't want them spending any time together. Walt doesn't care, but Locke says, he's your father and you need to show him respect. Before Walt can walk away, Michael comes charging up, yelling that he told Locke to stay away. Locke offers Michael a pencil as a peace offering. But Michael says if he catches Locke with his son again, he'll kill him. This seems like a huge overreaction, and Locke walks away, as everyone at the caves watches. Walt calls Michael a jerk, and says Michael never cared about him, and was never around when he was growing up. Walt yells, you're not my father. Michael says he can't change the past, throws Walt's comic book in the fire, and sends him for a time out. My God. So dramatic. <laughs> yes. I just have like all the feelings from this scene. Mm-hmm. Michael makes me so angry. <laughs> yeah, he's he's ridiculous. <laughs> he just he when he throws the comic into the fire, my mouth like literally dropped. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> like who would do that to their kid? It's like their one thing. I'm just imagining that I have my daughter on the island with me and I she's got her one book. And she loves it, and I just toss it in the fire. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's completely awful <laughs> when you put it like that. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It is. It's like, uh, but it's it's so immature in a way too. It you is. Know? It's yeah. It's definitely something that's done in the heat of the moment. But man, get yeah. it together, Michael. For real. Also, the fact that Michael is threatening to kill Locke. Yes. The guy who with the four hundred knives. Much worse than the comic thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's I should also, probably be more focused on that. Right, but it's also ridiculous when he says it. Do you know what I mean? It's just like that no. Yeah, it's ridiculous that you think you have a chance of doing that. Exactly. It's like when Boone threatened Said. Said was like, Are you kidding me? Get away from me. <laughs> yeah, only Locke has the decency to not laugh in his face. Right. I was just laughing when I was watching it because I was like, Michael, you do not know who you're dealing with here. Locke has the patience of a saint in this episode. He really does. He comes off extremely well, which is such a contrast from last week when he was a complete psycho, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of facets to Locke, for yeah, sure. He's... But he's always good with Walt, I feel like. Yeah, he is good with Walt. He's very protective of him, and part of being protective of Walt is protecting his relationship with his father. Mm-hmm. And Locke will take a bullet for that cause. But, I don't know if you noticed, he takes the pencil back when he leaves. Does he? <laughs> 
I was like, yes. <laughs> that pencil thing cracked me up. I was just like, hey, don't be mad. Here's this pencil. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And that would be so useful, Michael. I know, right. What's wrong with you? Oh, Michael. <laughs> in a flashback, Michael is in a wheelchair in a hospital, drawing something for Walt. It's been a few months since his accident. A nurse comes over and they chat about Walt. Susan shows up at the hospital. She heard about Michael's accident and came to visit, but she didn't bring Walt. She pushes Michael around the hospital. He's expected to make a full recovery after some physical therapy. She says she's covering all of Michael's medical bills that he suspects an ulterior motive. Sure enough, Susan tells him that she and Brian are getting married. They're going to move to Italy and Brian wants to adopt Walt. Michael is pissed off, but Susan tells him to think about what's best for Walt. This may be the only scene where I don't like Susan. Yeah, she does not come off great in this scene. <laughs> I would have forgiven everything if she had brought Walt. Yeah. I just can't believe she wouldn't bring Walt. You have a chance for Michael to actually see his son. And she's clearly trying to disconnect the two of them. Right. But but why? Like, all the other things that you want to do are perfectly reasonable. Like, you met someone, you want to marry them. That's all fine. Like, that's what happens. That's life. Mm -hmm. But here's a chance for you to let the father of your son at least see him and, like, at least make his day a little better before you knock him down. Right, especially because he's been in the hospital for months covering from a horrible, horrible accident. Like... Hey. <laughs> Good God. I just, I can't imagine going to, like, the father of my child who's in the hospital in a wheelchair. It's like, hey, you know, I didn't bring your son who you haven't seen in months, but do you mind signing over, like, all of his rights? All of your rights as his father? That'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like she won't throw him any bone. Yeah. And I feel like in her mind, because she says she's covering all of his medical bills, that kind of makes up for it all, but it, mm -hmm. it really doesn't. <laughs> yeah, not at all. Back at the caves, Hurley comes over to Michael and tells him Walt is gone. He took Vincent and left. Michael says he knows where he's going. I, I love this, like, hard cut to this scene. It's just, I want to know how many minutes have passed since Walt was in his timeout. Why weren't you oh. watching Walt, Michael? Like, you should have known he was going to sneak away at the first opportunity. You're just like, <laughs> he's like just sitting there looking down at the ground. And Hurley comes over and he's like, dude, Walt just walked off. Like, what are you doing? I know. Like, where would you be without the help of all these people? <laughs> yeah, I feel like, and this is probably not true, but I feel like it's been like three minutes since he sent Walt first <laughs> time out. And Hurley's like, dude, he's gone. Like, why weren't you watching him? Yeah, at least three minutes. It could be longer. Who knows how long he's been pouting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Michael finds Locke and Boone and demands to know where Walt is, even though he's very clearly not around at the moment. Locke says he told Walt they couldn't hang out anymore and that he was trying to respect Michael's wishes. He offers to help Michael find Walt. Because he is the bigger man. Yeah, it's pretty nice of him at this point. <laughs> I mean, Michael threatened to kill him, what, an hour ago? <laughs> I know. Jesus. Michael does not deserve Locke's help, but Walt does. Yeah, good point. Locke is, you know, he's not as immature as Michael. He can he can make that difference. <laughs> right. He'll, he'll suck it up and deal with this guy for the sake of his kid. Locke would be a great dad. Mm, yeah, <laughs> he would, especially because his dad is kind of the worst. Yeah. <laughs> He's just very protective and he likes teaching people. I yeah. We've seen a lot of teacher moments from him. Let's hope he didn't teach his son the same way he taught Boone last episode. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever it takes. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. Locke's motto. <laughs> Kate helps Charlie bring Claire's luggage back to the caves. She asks him how he's doing and he says that even though he barely knows Claire, her abduction has been really hard. He feels like pieces of himself are crumbling. Kate tells him it's good he's keeping her stuff safe for when she gets back. She walks away, and in one of the cutest scenes ever, 
Charlie struggles with not reading Claire's diary. <laughs> I love this scene. It's amazing. <laughs> I love this scene, too, because there are so many moments when you feel like, okay, they're going to cut now. Yeah. They're going to cut it. Oh, they're not going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> Just goes on and on. It's fantastic. It is. It's so funny. It feels kind of Buffy-ish. <laughs> it does feel kind of Buffy-ish. David Fury. <laughs> of course. <laughs> It's it's so funny, and it just it wouldn't work if Dominic Monaghan wasn't so lovely. Yeah, <laughs> he's just he's so cute. He sells it so well. Oh, I just want him to be in everything I watch. I really do. <laughs> Would you read the diary? Ooh, interesting question. Um, yes, I would. Just because of the way she was abducted so violently. Mm-hmm. Any clues I could get from that, I feel like. I would have to read it. Yeah. I feel like that, too. I'm surprised. I I thought you were going to say no. No. I would so, read it. <laughs> so, wait. Why were you so mad that Sawyer would read it, even though he didn't? It's because of his intent. Like, I feel like Charlie Charlie's interested in knowing what Claire has to say, but he's also reading it, I feel like, because he, you know, he's concerned about her. He says her abduction has been really hard on him. Mm -hmm. Sawyer wouldn't be thinking about that he'd just be looking for some entertainment and i feel like this scene earlier where he was mocking charlie about you know what she has supposedly written in there i feel like if he would have done the same thing if he actually had read the diary you know just to get a rise out of charlie mm -hmm. the other thing that i really love in this scene is kate yeah she is wonderful she seems so in touch with what is going on with everybody on mm -hmm. the island? And she's so sweet to Charlie. She's just like really hopeful and strong and like reassuring. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's kind of easy to forget about her in this episode. But no, she does a great job here. I'm just noticing her connection with so many different people on the island. Mm hmm. Like, other people just kind of seem to float back and forth between a few different characters. But Kate just kind of, she can talk to anybody and connect with almost anybody. Yeah, that's so true. And I feel like she's often the one who, when things are getting out of hand, she's the one who steps in and kind of brings everyone down before they go completely crazy. Yes, definitely. Underrated character, that Kate. <laughs> Very. <laughs> So crazy. Walt is walking Vincent through the jungle alone. Vincent starts barking, and Walt stares at the trees, looking scared. Vincent breaks away from his leash and runs off, with Walt chasing after him. In Walt's flashback, Walt is doing his homework, which is about birds of Australia. Susan and Brian are talking in the background when she suddenly feels dizzy, and Brian leads her over to the couch. Walt tries to get Brian to look at something, but he's too focused on Susan. All of a sudden, a bird flies into the window and dies. Brian and Walt go to look, Walt asking if the bird is dead. He then goes back to his book about birds. I'm sure there's no connection there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that can't possibly mean anything. Yeah. I've just never known what to make of this scene. <laughs> Not either. Walt is an, enig an enigma. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it has such a creepy undertone. Like, I feel like it could be the opening to any horror movie about <laughs> a creepy, possessed child. Yeah. You know? It totally could be. Especially because Brian seems so super freaked out by Walt. Right. The look he gives Walt is like, whoa. Right. But yeah, I mean, all these things could also just be a coincidence. So it's hard to know what to think. <laughs> yeah, they could be, but I don't think they are. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I just don't know what it means. It's just hard because if these things had only started happening to Walt when he got on the island, it would be one thing. But right. the fact that they were happening, you know, in the real world before they were ever, they ever got to the island is, I don't know. It's interesting. That's true. I hadn't thought about that because. Locke is, he's special on the island. Right. And I mean, he seems to know he's going to be special, that he is special, but 
it doesn't seem like he is until he gets to the island. Right. So what is the difference between him and Walt? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> so many questions. I know. I just, <laughs> I'm sitting here trying to think of an answer. Yeah. I have none. We don't <laughs> we have all the ask, answers, guys. <laughs> we're going to consult with Locke because he tends to know the answers to these things. That's but. true. <laughs> There is that line that he has when he and Walt are throwing the knives mm-hmm. and Walt's like, it's like I saw it happening before it happened. Like it really did. And Locke says, well, who's to say that it, that it didn't really happen? <laughs> okay. I feel like he's just like, <laughs> okay, this is not an answer to our questions, but he's in tune with that part of Walt and he, I feel like he has some sort of understanding of it. Or at least he's open-minded to it, I guess. That makes my brain hurt, just thinking about that possibility. (laughs) The frustration is that we really don't talk about this very much after this episode. I know. That's why I feel like we have to talk about it now. (laughs) Right. Because it's just going to kind of disappear slowly. Right. Like, I guess other weird things with Walt happen, but zero explanations. (laughs) That's lost sometimes. (laughs) Very true. (laughs) Back in the jungle... Walt appears to have lost Vincent. He hears rustling and growling in the bushes and looks terrified. In a flashback, Brian knocks on Michael's door. He informs him that Susan died the day before of a blood disorder. Walt is back at home with his nanny. Brian tells Michael that Susan wanted him to have custody of Walt, even though Michael hasn't been around Walt for basically his entire life. Brian says he loves Susan but that he was always honest with her and never wanted to be a father. Michael reminds him that Brian adopted Walt, and he says that was only because Susan wanted him to. He hands Michael an envelope with plane tickets and travel expenses for the trip from Sydney to New York. Michael understandably throws Brian against the wall, stating Brian is the only father Walt has ever known, but Brian admits there's something off about Walt. He's different, And things happen when he's around. I mean, Brian's just the worst, right? Can we agree on that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of terrible. Dude, I know your wife just died, but maybe you should take more than 24 hours to think before you dump Walt with a father he doesn't even remember. Right. He just must be really freaked out by Walt. I guess. I don't know how much to, like, give him a pass for that. (laughs) Mm. He gets no passes from me. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you married someone and their kids scared you, and then they died, what would you do? Yeah, I don't know. Because I feel like if he really loved Susan like he said he did, he would do his best to try and keep Walt. Right. Because that's what Susan would want. Exactly. So, yeah, I agree. I think it's interesting that... So, Brian didn't want to be a father... And he was for 10 years of Walt's life. Mm -hmm. Michael desperately wanted to be Walt's father and he couldn't be. But now that he can be, Michael doesn't want to. Yeah, that's a good point. It's really interesting to see how like it's when they don't want to be his father that they kind of come into that situation. Yeah, that's true. Poor Walt. (laughs) I know. He seems like a really nice kid. I know weird stuff happens, but he's a pretty good kid. Entertains himself. Not too much work. Yeah, I'm surprised he's as normal as he is, (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Also, this scene kind of makes me not think so highly of Susan. Because if what Brian says is true, that he was always honest with Susan and told her he never wanted to be a father... And then she kind of, I don't know, forced him to adopt Walt. Like, that's kind of messed up. (laughs) You know? Yes, but I think I can understand that because she is a lawyer and that does give Walt some legal protection being adopted by him, right? Yeah, I mean, that's true. I think she just thinks it's best for Walt. But is it best for Walt to be adopted by someone who never wanted to be a father like i'm just thinking more of the emotional things like Mm -hmm. if susan hadn't died and walt had grown up with brian you know for years and years and years i wonder if 
Brian would eventually have accepted it or if their relationship would have just been, you know, really screwed up because Brian never wanted to be a father in the first place, you know? Yeah. Well, and it seems like he didn't accept it. I mean, Walt's 10. He's, you know, he's had plenty of time to bond with him. Yep. And he abandoned him 24 hours. Right. Clearly he didn't work. (laughs) God, what a jerk. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is what I mean. Like, after I saw this scene, I kind of forgave Michael for a lot because it's like, dude, Brian's just awful. (laughs) See, I feel like Brian is awful, but I don't think I forgive Michael. (laughs) Not for everything. Yeah. I mean, I probably shouldn't, but I just feel like maybe it's also the fact that Michael is in this scene yelling at Brian being like, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, what are you doing? This is (laughs) insane. (laughs) Yeah. This is one of the first times in the episode I feel on Michael's side. Yeah, same. Michael and Locke find Vincent's leash in the jungle. They hear Walt screaming from afar and run toward him. In another flashback, Michael arrives at Walt's house in Australia. Actually, I guess it's Brian's house, not Walt's house, but... (laughs) Eh, it should be Walt's house. Yeah, Brian's not there, (laughs) so anyway. (laughs) The nanny gives Michael a box, which she thinks Walt should have. The box appears to be full of letters, and Walt arrives home from school. In the jungle, Walt is trapped underneath a tree while a polar bear is attacking him. Locke stops Michael from charging in and leads him another way. Back in Australia, Walt is playing with Vincent. Michael approaches and introduces himself as his father. He says he's sorry about his mom and that they used to love each other. Michael says he's come to bring Walt home with him, but Walt says he's not going anywhere with Michael. Walt asks where Brian is, and in a very decent move, Michael lies to him. Instead of telling Walt what a selfish jerk Brian is, Michael assures Walt that Brian loves him, but it's Michael's decision to bring Walt home. Walt asks about Vincent, who apparently belongs to Brian, and Michael tells him Brian said he could have the dog, Because honestly, it's the very least Brian could do at this point. (laughs) Good move, Michael. Yeah. (laughs) I love that quick decision on Michael's part. He's like, oh, that's your dog now. Forget about Brian. (laughs) His face is great, too. Yeah, Oh, he said you could have him. (laughs) This is a good scene for Michael. Yeah, I like it a lot. It's, It's definitely a great moment for him to lie and cover for Brian. Yeah, I don't know if I would have done that. I don't know if I would have been as big of a person as Michael is in the scene. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's just selflessness looking out for Walt. Yeah. He's already, he just lost his mom, like, to think his stepdad doesn't want him. Fair point. One less burden. But man, Brian sucks for not being there to explain this or ease the transition. Like, yeah, I mean, he's the worst. Like, uh, how did you do this to a 10 year old? What were you thinking, Susan? No, what do you see in this exactly. dude? Exactly. <laughs> in the jungle, Locke and Michael climb a tree and try to get to Walt before he's eaten by the polar bear. They throw Walt a knife to defend himself, and Michael is able to climb down on a rope. Locke pulls Walt to safety, and Michael stabs the polar bear with the knife. Michael and Walt hug. Walt says he's sorry. And Michael says he's glad he's okay. Walt's worried about Vincent, but Locke assures him he'll find his way back to camp. Michael and Locke seem to reach an understanding, since Locke did just, you know, help slave Walt's life. (laughs) It's ironic how mad Michael was at Locke, and (laughs) he was so angry about all the knife-throwing stuff, and then here he is, with the knife, saving Walt. (laughs) So ironic. (laughs) What a slap in the face. I know. (laughs) But Locke gives the knife to Michael, and Michael gives the knife to Walt. Yeah, that's an important distinction. Right. Definitely. But yeah, I like the little look they give each other at the end of the scene. It's like, yeah. Yeah, definitely a a bonding moment. Yeah. (laughs) Just got to get attacked by stuff on this island, and then you bond with people. (laughs) Sure. That's that's the way to go. (laughs) There's also that question again of, you know, the polar bear was obviously shown in Michael or in Walt's comic book. Right. And now there's a polar bear, which could have already just been there. Or 
Mike or Walt could have manifested it. Who knows? It's never right. explained. <laughs> Combine that with the bird scene and you think Walt must have made this polar bear. But did Walt do that before? Is this right. the same polar bear? Mm -hmm. It's very ambiguous. <laughs> Super weird. I don't know which way I lean. I, I think if I have to choose either way, I would say that Walt created this polar bear and it came about because of, cause when the scene with the bird happened with the window, mm -hmm. Walt was like upset because they weren't paying attention to him. And then this polar bear comes when he's upset again. Oh uh, yeah. That's a good point. Huh. See, I was going to say, I don't really believe it, but now that you said that, <laughs> I don't know about the first polar bear though. <laughs> yeah. Like, did, did Walt do that when he was upset about the plane crash? I don't know. <laughs> is everything on this island Walt's fault? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> did he create the, the monster as well? <laughs> right. Maybe he did. Oh, Walt. <laughs> that night, Michael brings Walt a present. It's the box that the nanny gave to Michael in Australia. It's filled with every card and letter Michael ever wrote to Walt. Susan apparently never gave them to Walt, which seems like questionable parenting. <laughs> Walt wonders why his mom never gave them to him, and Michael says he doesn't know, but that she also didn't throw them away. They sit and look through the cards together. I like this scene. Me too. It's nice. I think it's Michael's best moment. Yes. When he defends Susan. Yeah, again, taking the high road here. Yeah. Because it would be easy to cut her down and be like, I don't know. Your mom always kept you away from me. And he doesn't do that. Right. Again, I wish we got more scenes with Susan. I would love to know what her reasoning would have been for not ever giving these things to Walt. Yeah. I mean, I can understand it to a point. You know, he's a kid and... I don't know if Walt is quite at the age... I mean, he might be at the age now, but for a long time, he just wouldn't understand who this person is sending him random stuff every year. Like, if you're not meeting him and keeping in contact, like, why try to explain that and confuse your child? That's true, but I always... Whenever I see scenes like this in movies and TV, I always think about when that child is 18 or 21. And they find that box and they're like, what the hell is this, mom? And then it's like all downhill and dramatic from there. Yeah. And bad things happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, that's why I feel like at his age now is when you have the ability to kind of start that conversation. When yeah. he's like a six-year-old, that may not be the best time. Well, I mean, they wouldn't even have had to have like a sit-down chat. Like, I would have understood it more if Michael had been, like, a bad person. Right. Or, like, he doesn't seem like a bad guy. He, he wants, he wanted to be Walt's dad. It didn't work out. That's true. You know, like, I feel like Susan could have been like, you know, and here's the one card your dad sends you every year. Like, <laughs> you don't, you know, we're here. He's there. We're probably not going to see him, but he does still, like, acknowledge and care about you. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a parent. What do I know? <laughs> it's just confusing because, like, does Walt think that Brian is his biological father? No, because he calls him Brian. Right. So he knows he has a dad out there somewhere. Yeah, I wonder what Susan told him about yeah. Michael. I want to say that Walt talks about this at some point. But I can't okay. remember. Ooh, I, w I hope he does. I would be very interested to know. I hope he does, too. I'm not positive. <laughs> Maybe I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Charlie is reading Claire's diary. Clearly, he wasn't able to resist the temptation. We see passages from the diary, with Claire describing how she really likes Charlie and that he makes her feel safe. Charlie reads something else and goes running to find Jack who's sitting by a fire with Saeed. Charlie reads a passage from the diary about a dream Claire had about a black rock. Saeed confirms that Rousseau mentioned something about her team in the black rock. 
He thinks it might be the triangle on the maps, and Charlie guesses that's where Claire might be. Jack says maybe, but that they can't go searching in the jungle in the middle of the night. Meanwhile, in the jungle in the middle of the night, Locke and Boone (laughs) are searching for Vincent, using Locke's handy dog whistle. They hear a noise in the bushes, but instead of Vincent, Claire comes stumbling out, looking scared. And with that massive cliffhanger, we cut to credits. Dun, dun, dun. For real. I remember watching that for the first time, being like, what? No. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. It's a great way to end the episode. I guess we'll save the Claire talk for when we actually have more Claire to talk about. But mm-hmm. I do love this scene. It's the perfect note to end it on. Yeah. I agree. It's so interesting. <laughs> I feel like everything I want to say is just a spoiler for next episode. I so. know. I have so many spoilerific <laughs> thoughts from this episode. Me too. Not just in this scene. <laughs> That's going to get harder and harder as we it, keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe easier because we'll have less to spoil, right? Maybe. Like, as time goes on, maybe. Mm-hmm. I sure. Don't know. <laughs> so did you have a hard time with the theme? Yes. <laughs> I really, really did. <laughs> I kind of did too. I I had one. I mean, I have one, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I don't. It's not very strong. It's so simple. I said, "What makes a good parent?" Okay, I kind of said the same thing. So okay, okay, yeah. Because <laughs> I feel like there's not a lot of other stuff going on. It's all parenting, right? Right. So I feel like we're saying that it's selflessness that makes a good parent. Mm -hmm. because it's whenever Michael makes the selfless choice for Walt that he is a good dad. And that just seems like kind of obvious to say, but (laughs) he has so many selfish moments that his selfless ones really stand out. Right. Even the the selfless ones he makes, you know, in the flashbacks in Australia, those especially stand out. Yeah, and I feel like every time he tries to see Walt and connect with him, it's because that's what Michael wants, and it doesn't work because Mm -hmm. it's all for himself. It's only when he comes to Walt for Walt's sake that he actually gets to be with Walt. Yeah, that's a good point. That's true. I mean, that's still a complicated thing because... You know, he he's doing it because he wants to, but it's a good thing for a parent to want to be with their kid, Mm -hmm. you know? So, I don't know. It's messy. It is messy, and I don't feel like the show really comes down hard on, you know, one or the other side of it. It kind of leaves it open-ended. For sure. His good moments are obviously selfless moments. Mm -hmm. He takes on the burden of, you know... Brian and Susan's mistakes just for the sake of doing it to hurt Walt less. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going with this, Michael. It's, it makes you such a better parent. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's just, Michael is so strange because it feels like in the day to day moments, he cannot deal with Walt. He doesn't understand him. He doesn't know how to talk to him. But like he cares and in the big moments like when it comes down to it i feel like he is gonna do the right thing for walt yeah that's so true yeah it's like you said like in the day-to-day moments he seems like he doesn't really care but then in the big moments it's almost like he cares too much sometimes you know yeah and i don't even feel like it's that he doesn't care in the day-to-day moments it's just that he doesn't seem to know how to handle them because mm-hmm. he's always like yelling at Walt for disappearing or whatever it is. And it's like he thinks that's what he's supposed to do. I don't know. I don't know why he does that. <laughs> well, yeah, I feel like it's partly because, I mean, he doesn't really know how to be a dad. He hasn't had to be Walt's dad or anyone's dad really right. ever. So, And that line when he tells son, like, I missed his childhood and... Like, I can't treat him like an adult now. Like, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, it's selfish in a way that he's like trying to kind of reclaim Walt's childhood, but it already happened. Right. So, of course, Walt is not on board with this. Right. <laughs> but it does do a lot to explain, you know, his shortcomings. Yeah. Because I can't imagine a harder job to just get dropped into. <laughs> yeah, that would be my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Here's your kid. He's 10. His mom just died. He's kind of weird. Maybe psychic. I don't know. <laughs> yep. Also, you're about to crash on a desert island. Bye. Like, good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a nightmare. <laughs> but yeah, I kind of wrote the same thing. This show, I'm noticing now, not that I didn't notice the other times I've watched Lost, but we could spend a whole episode just talking about parents. And yes. the different relationships we get with the characters and their parents or the characters and their kids. It's, it's really fascinating. Yes. That is definitely a huge theme throughout the whole show. But yeah. I just wrote that, like, you have to, the show seems to be saying, you really have to find the right balance between authority and respect when you're dealing with kids who are Walt age, which also seems like, Duh, like, that's such an obvious statement, but, <laughs> you know, they go back to that a lot in this episode, I feel like. Yeah, because it's just such a struggle for Michael to find that balance. Right. Like, he just, he desperately wants Walt's respect, but he has no idea how to get it. Mm -hmm. Locke does not try at all, and he has it wholeheartedly. Yeah, with no effort whatsoever, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, and Locke's totally right. You know, he's he treats Walt with respect, and that's all you need to do. Yeah. It makes me wish Locke had kids. I would love to see how that would have played out. I mm. wish Locke were, like, my grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would be the best grandpa. Oh, my God. <laughs> he would have the best stories, and he would be, like, handcrafting me all sorts of cool stuff. And yeah. Oh, he'd take me on adventures. We'd go camping all the time. Oh, that would be crazy. You would have the best stories about him. Yes. Oh, yeah. Locke, Locke should have a big family. Mm -hmm. He'd be a great family member. <laughs> this makes me so sad for Locke. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> so I was looking up names in this episode because there's actually a lot of names. We've got like Michael and Walt and Susan and Brian and then all their last names. Uh-huh. But none of them really amount to anything. Oh. The only one that was like kind of of note was Walt and Susan's last name is Lloyd. And Lloyd means gray. So the only reason that feels somewhat significant is because of that black and white theme we've kind of been noticing. Right. So. Interesting. Maybe Walt is gray. <laughs> <laughs> Take that as you will. <laughs> I like that. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, that's it for the name corner. <laughs> <laughs> I like that we have name corner on Freckles and Blondie. <laughs> yeah, we really need a better name for this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to think of some sort of alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> All good titles have alliteration. Of course. <laughs> Except Freckles and Blondie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's going to wrap it up for this week. Thank you guys for listening and all of your support. You can connect with us on Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to visit our website, thelostpodcast.com. If you have questions, comments, or opinions on anything we discuss, and I know you guys do, you can email us at randy or tiffany at thelostpodcast.com. Oh, let me interject. Oh, please. <laughs> I haven't told you this, Randy. I made a new email. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I made the email freckles at the lost podcast dot com. That way people don't have to choose. <laughs> oh, good idea. Okay. I just feel like it makes more sense. Okay, so email us at freckles and blondie at the lost podcast dot com. <laughs> Hashtag professional. Yeah. <laughs> also, please don't forget to take a few minutes and leave us a review on iTunes. Um, it really helps us get more people listening to the show, and we super, super appreciate it. Super duper. <laughs> Tune in next week when we'll be discussing 
like I said earlier, one of my personal favorite episodes, episode 15, which is called Homecoming, where we get to take another look into Charlie's past. Yay! Yes, I'm so excited. I'm excited too. (laughs) I have no idea what's going to happen, but you're excited, so I'm excited. It's so good. I hope it doesn't disappoint. (laughs) (laughs) All right, tune in next week to the episode when Tiffany crushes all of Randy's dreams. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys, I'm Randy. And I'm Tiffany. And this has been Freckles and Blondie. In a flashback. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like. You're <laughs>